down at Bold Schools and I welcome everybody to something new. Uh, I have never experienced this as far as a forum with uh, dealing with a referendum. So, so this is a, a new adventure. And so, but trying to get information out and give the general public of Bold Area Schools an opportunity to ask questions, to uh, um, think things that you're wondering about. We, we've tried to put as much information we can on our district website and, and the Be Bold uh, Step Up uh, website. And so we uh, want you to look at that and uh, spend some time on it. There's a lot of questions there, uh, Q and A. And so um, you can also uh, communicate through Facebook uh, on the website. And so you can uh, have an opportunity to communicate with us. And this is a, a big um, investment in what we're asking. And so tonight uh, we're planning on staying until probably eight o'clock. And so we've got an hour and a half where We'll have, ask questions or have questions you can ask and we'll, we'll answer it. But it's a virtual public forum. And so that's the purpose of it is for you to have an opportunity to ask questions. So with us today, uh, we've got uh, tonight, we've got uh, Ryan Hoffman. Ryan Hoffman works with ICS and we've been working with him since uh, for two years now. We're working with a community group and uh, we've had five task force meetings that we've uh, we've uh, entertained lots of information and uh, and have presented a lot of materials and so that is all on our website uh, the minutes of those meetings so feel free to to uh, look at that and see what all has gone into this but the ward has worked very hard lots of meetings and a lot of community meetings and so now Tonight, there's uh, an opportunity here for you to, to ask questions of Ryan and myself, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So, so at this time, um, Ryan, uh, I'll introduce you, Ryan Hoffman of ICS, and, uh, and he can be our moderator tonight. So welcome, Ryan. All righty. Thank you, Dale. Um, yeah, first off, uh, this is new to me too, operating this type of environment and, and situation. So hopefully you, you bear with me if, if something is technically not happening uh, right or, or maybe takes a little longer than, <laughs> than what it should, but I'll get through it uh, hopefully the best I can. And, and I'm, you know, as I'm talking, I'm, I'm monitoring people wanting to get in and things like that. So as my eyes move back and forth, I've got three screens in front of me. So I have information that I might be presenting and pulling back and, and adding. So uh, you know, just hopefully give me some benefit of the doubt there as, as we move forward. But um, yeah, as Dale said, uh, you know, what we have planned for tonight uh, is basically just a Q&A. So we know that there's a lot of questions out there. We've tried to be proactive in information um, being presented to, to the community, uh, but we know there's still questions. So there is no, you know, format or, or you know, presentation. Um, so hopefully we can just get to questions from people and, and see where it takes us. Uh, there is a chat function for those of you that are, are new to, to Zoom or, or maybe even uh, have used it quite a bit. If, if you kind of move your mouse around where the, pick, the people's faces are, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a kind of right in the middle, just a box that looks like a, a word box that says chat underneath it. If you click on that, the chat part will come up on the the side of the screen. And if you just want to type your question in there, that's a way to do it too. And we'll try to get to those as, as quickly as possible if, if people aren't talking. Um, I'm going to keep the majority of people muted as much as I can because that can get uh, pretty, pretty uh, disturbing you know, if, you, if you can't hear what's going on. So uh, excuse me if I mute you, if you're not one that's talking. I want to make sure that we, we get everybody uh, heard that we can. So. Uh, if you're not talking, maybe mute yourself. Make sure, make sure that uh, you are muted. I am recording the the, the evening, so hopefully, uh, as the conversations go and uh, we we look at questions, or or maybe we don't get to a, some of the questions, uh, we can refer back and and refer back to the the recording and answer questions that way. Uh, our goal is if there's questions in the chat that don't get addressed tonight. Um, we'll, we'll print those off and we'll do our best to answer those and publish those then again on 
uh, the BeBoldStepUp.org website and probably provide a link to that or the question and answers on the district's Facebook page as well. So we'll try to we'll try to do our best here to, to get through all this. And it looks like we're we're approaching 65, 67 uh, participants. The the max I was allowed to have via Zoom is 100. So I don't know if we're going to get there or not, but we'll see. Um, the first thing we want to do just though before we start uh, the Q&A is, is we're going to play a little video. Some of you might have already seen it uh, that the district put together for the referendum effort. It provides some good information, but I, I want to play that. That's uh, three minutes and 21 seconds long. And then after that, we'll, we'll uh, start the, the Q&A process. So uh, we're going to go with that here. <laughs> Are you having troubles, Ryan, or? No. It's... Are you not seeing it? Uh, no. Is oh. it brave? <laughs> I've been watching the video, so I, <laughs> here we go. All right. Starting off perfect. Um, <laughs> you guys have not been watching it, huh? No. Okay. I thought I was sharing my screen there, and apparently not. So. You... There we go. Man. There we go. Good. That, uh, that, that was embarrassing as you guys are all just staring <laughs> at me doing nothing, huh? We, got, we had a break. <laughs> all right. So there you go. Thanks for, thanks for playing along. All right. Here we go. No sound. Is Dale the only one? Give me a thumbs up if you see it and hear it. See it, but don't hear it. Can't hear it. Awesome. Hmm. Right. 
Brian, there's an option on your share screen to bypass or pass through the. You hear that? Checkbox. There you go. Dale, I, I didn't hear you. Did you hear that? No, I haven't heard anything yet. I see the step. Nothing's happening. Tom, did you want to share with Ryan what you were just saying? Uh, Ryan, there, there's an option on your share screen that you need to check to pass through the video, the, the audio from the video. I believe it's a checkbox. Can you all hear that? Nope. Not you. Well, not, the, not the video. Maybe we uh, stop that then. And we'll just get right to question and answer. I guess I uh, won't let this delay us any further. Are you well, hearing me? Uh, go on the website and everybody can watch it individually. I'm sorry about that. We'll figure it out. Thank you. Go ahead. Dale, if you were talking, I didn't hear you. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay, we'll, we, we can watch it individually. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, how we'll, we'll do this? I, I also, in the the uh, um, if you if you wave your mouse over where all the, the pictures are of people down at the bottom to the far kind of right of all the little icons, there's a reactions button, and one of those reactions is a hand. So if you have a question, push that hand, that'll come up on the screen for me, and then I'll select you so you can ask your question. We do have a couple questions in the chat that I can get to in the meantime if people uh, are, are wanting to um, take some time and, and understanding what they wanna ask. So I'll start with the, the, the chat questions until uh, I see any little hands pop up, so. Um, one question from Neil, it says the tax calculator tells us what the bond referendum will add to the RE taxes. I guess I don't know what RE means, but RE yeah. taxes. Real estate. Real estate taxes, maybe. Um, how much will the operating levy add to the residential, commercial, and farmland reach the respective values. There, there is no operating levy on the ballot. Um, the operating levy passed last November. So those tax impacts are already calculated and, and you're, that, that is the same this year as it will, was last year and will be for the, first, for the 10 years that the, the operating levy was, was put in place. So there's no additional operating levy taxes uh, included in, the, in this process. Um, where there, uh, were there any discussions concerning a new building where the current one is to, able, to be able to use the land we already have? Uh, so yes, we did discuss that. We went through that um, with the task force process and, and outside of that, even discussing how additions and renovations to the existing building could be used, how the existing property could be used. Um, the, the key factor in uh, going to the location that uh, is currently proposed is that potential wellness center with the hospital. That's a key component to the, the whole plan. Um, and, and, and even though right now it's not uh, a signed, sealed, and delivered option with this uh, new facility, uh, it is you know, op you know, an optimistic part of this proposed plan, the, the ability to use and uh, co-operate a space together with the hospital um, is, is very fiscally uh, advantageous for, for both entities uh, and you get more out of it. So that was the, the driving force in, in using the new land out by the, by the hospital property there. So hopefully that answers that question. And Dale, if you have anything you wanna respond, um, 
obviously jump in. Those are all the questions in the chat at this point. So anybody else have any questions? Maybe we want to talk a little bit about the timing of it as, as far as right now, uh, what's the right time to invest in school facilities, some of the advantages of yeah. that at, at this point, Ryan? Yeah, there, obviously we're, we're in a very unique and, and um, you know, you could use all sorts of different adjectives, but troubling or, or tough um, time with a, with a pandemic. That's, that's out there affecting people and businesses. Um, of course, the district understands that. There's been conversations around that uh, and wondering when the right time is and what the right time is. Uh, the, the, in, in my world, dealing with school districts and, and bond referendums, there is never a right time. Um, there's never been one district that, that we've worked with that everybody agreed that this was the best time to do whatever the project was that we're proposing. Um, the, the benefits out of this current time are interest rates are unbelievable. Um, right now, bonds are selling at a, at a 1.5-ish percentage rate. Um, that's tremendously low. Uh, our, our factors for the tax calculator are on interest rates around 3%. So there, if we were to sell bonds today, we'd be well underneath uh, the, the tax impact that, that we're proposing right now. Uh, and we don't see that changing for, for the foreseeable future, uh, uh, thankfully, um, but it, it is lower than if it was last year at this time. So that's a good thing. Um, but so the cost of the, the borrowing is very low. With that, um, right now in the public bid market, the, the construction market is good. Uh, there is uh, not a lot of private large projects being built. Um, so that drives competition to the public market, which is good. So we're seeing our current projects being bid out at, at good rates uh, and being able to, to come in at or under budget that, that we planned for you know, last year at this time. So uh, with those two things, uh, you know, construction timing is good, rates are good. It makes it a good time um, to start an investment like this. Uh, I know even though it's in a pandemic, which seems, you know, contradictory, it, it, is, a, it is a good thing uh, as far as the financial standpoint of, of paying that money back. Um, so that's why the district is continuing to pursue this. Uh, please describe the location of the proposed building, building relative to the hospital. Um, and it's a two-part question. Please describe what features a wellness center would have. So the, the location would be just to the east of the new hospital. There's kind of a 15-acre parcel right there that runs kind of north-south. It's, it's more rectangular than square. So it's just to the east of the hospital. Uh, that's the, the proposed location. In the plan, there's also um, more acreage uh, to be purchased around that whole site. So that's part of the plan. The district has I've spoken with a uh, landowner around that area. Uh, we have, do not have the land purchased at this time. Of course, the district is not in a position to purchase land for a project that they don't know if uh, the taxpayers are gonna support. So they, they will not purchase land first. Um, the, the approval of the referendum would be the first thing. And then there is allocated money to purchase land. Uh, obviously with this being a public process, you know, we, we have public documents that are out there that, that show what the planning costs and what we, we figure uh, land acquisition to be. So we're, we're unfortunately showing our cards uh, to that negotiating process a little bit, but at the same time, you know, there's market values that we can plan on and, and, and we're prepared for that. So there is an additional 18 acres, if not more, uh, to be purchased in, in uh, conjunction with the current 15 acre parcel that the hospital has, has uh, approved to use. So plenty of land for the building, parking lots. Um, question two of the, the referendum is the athletic facility. So plenty of room to, to put that in if that were to pass too, uh, and, and room for expansion um, for both the school and if a wellness center was built uh, as well. So the second part of that question would be to describe the features of a wellness center. 
Well, the wellness center isn't part of the plan. So I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time talking about the wellness center um, because it's not uh, part of what we're proposing. Uh, just quickly though, a typical wellness center, you're going to see gyms, locker rooms, fitness areas, um, you know, kind of community classrooms, if you will. All of those are typical components of wellness centers, but uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, what's the expected lifespan of this new building? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question, right? Um, buildings uh, aren't built to last forever and ever without proper maintenance, and I won't belabor that and get into that too much, but um, you know, our, our expectancy with this building is it would last as your current, as long as your current buildings would last for sure. Uh, with pristine maintenance, it would last much longer. Um, but you know, factoring that most of the life cycle systems within a building, you talk about the mechanical systems or the flooring or things like that, they do cycle out in anywhere between you know 10 to 30 years, depending on what that system is or what that finish is. Um, so they have to be replaced. And if they're replaced accordingly, then that extends the life of a building. Uh, so you know it, it, it's in no way, shape, or form, I think, for the district to um, communicate that this building, once it's built, if you just walk away from it with no maintenance, that it's going to last forever. It won't. Uh, we will need to provide maintenance and there will need to be plans for those maintenance items. Um, and there will be some, some big ticket items coming down the road. That will be decades from now, but that planning will have to be done and, and uh, taken into account for, for future needs. So the, the building structure, can it last 50, 75, 100 years? Yes, it can. But that doesn't mean that um, once it's built, you can just plan on that without any future work uh, to the building itself. And that's something the uh, the administrative team, the staff at the, the building, when they're budgeting, um, when we passed uh, worked on our excess levy, one of the things uh, we looked at was not uh, having that as high as it should be, because if we would go to a new facility, it would be costs or uh, maintenance would be less. Uh, to start with. And so during that time, uh, the amount of money that we get from the state for, to set aside for maintenance then needs to be set aside. And that, and that would be the goal as, as we move forward. And so you and uh, a roof needs repair that uh, you've got that money in, uh, in your account and your general fund that uh, you can uh, afford to take care of that. And so I think that's, that's key to the management uh, the finance management of the of the facilities as you move forward, and so, yeah, you can't. Uh, every building is going to have maintenance needs, and so you have to try and keep up with those. But um, one thing uh, we uh, we I'd like to just mention, uh, Ryan, is that our review and comment, which we, uh, when the plan is uh, board officially the plan they're looking at. Uh, uh, recommendations by Ryan and his group. Um, then we submitted that plan to the State Department, and they uh, call they go through what they call a review and comment. And they we did get the approval back, and so that'll be at our next board meeting in the end of, end of the month. Um, but that uh, two things they looked at, and you can correct me on some of this, uh, Ryan. You've done more of these than I have, but two of the things they look at is what is the square footage for square square foot. And uh, does it fit the, the student population? And that was one thing that they definitely was a strength that the size that we're building is, is appropriate for our size population. The other thing they looked at is, do we have the tax base uh, at Bold to support the building? And that's the other thing they, they look at. And, uh, and they did their study and they come back and they approved that also. So those are the two main items they look at when they review and uh, review and comment, then uh, you don't really, uh, you can go ahead and with the building project uh, without their approval, but uh, you wanna have your the state uh, department have the approval. And then you only need 50% of your cash vote, otherwise you need 60%. So, um, so that's pretty important that uh, the state department has reviewed it it's gone through it, it's gone through the bond council and it's come back and the State Department has given us the approval, so. 
I do see one person raising their hand, so I'm going to John unmute somehow. Neil, I'm I'm trying to. Oh, how's that? There you yeah. go. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just, uh, I'd sent it back in a chat. Uh, that, that other question earlier about the operating levy, I, I appreciate that it was uh, not, that's not on the, uh, for the question, but I think people have been just asking how much is the operating levy that was approved in 2019 going to add to the taxes in addition to the referendum? I, that was where I was trying to tee that question up for the other party. So um, if, if somebody could answer that, or maybe in the future, how much more is that gonna add the tax calculator uh, gives us information for the referendum, but how much in addition will the operating levy add the, next year the, or whenever that's going to be in place? That that was say, I'm sorry, that was the intended question. Yep. So the the operating um, levy is already on your tax, your property tax rolls. So it's already calculated into what you paid this year for your property tax. So the the amount for the referendum that we have in the tax calculator on the website. That is the full amount that will be impacted. It's it's already on our taxes. Yep. All right, it's I'll have to look at that again. All right, yep. okay. Um, I, had a, I had another question, if I can, while I while I have the, sure. then I'll unmute myself. Uh, there was a, a a rumor going around, and I just just for clarity, um, it was understood or my understanding that maybe. Um, well, I say I'll, I'll say it two two different ways. My, two of my kids in my house have received, uh, who are non-taxpayers, have received flyers asking them to get out and vote. Um, one of them is a 2014 graduate. One is a 2018 graduate. Uh, the taxpayers in the house, Brenda and I, have not received a flyer. Uh, just curious if you could, if somebody could address that, please. I, That's, uh, I don't know, Ryan, if we can check into that, but... Uh, the, every every household got it should have gotten a flyer, so I'm not sure. Yeah. We could yeah, so so two of, two of my kids got one addressed to them recently, Lil, Lily, and uh, but Brenda and I did. So I everyone every household was supposed to get it. It maybe just got tied up in the postal COVID or something. I'm not sure. Okay. So um, you, quick question, you know? last question, and I'm done uh, for a while. Is a, there's a rumor going around that that bold was that went to the Olivia nursing home with some ballots to try to get some residents to vote. Is that correct or incorrect? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I'll try to unmute myself here or mute myself. Excuse me. Sure. I don't know how to do it. I'll do it. Um, so just to, to clarify, the district has sent out one mailing. Uh, it was a four page colored uh, multi-informational type mailing. You should have got it within the last week. That's the only mailing the district has, has sent out. And that went out to every, every tax paying household. So that's, you should have received that. Um, hopefully the, you know, we, we rely on mail systems to give us the names and addresses of people within the district. And, and that's the, the service we use. So, um, Ryan, oh, yeah. this is Joy. Yeah. Can I address that for a minute? Sure. I, I sent out the flyers, one per household. So I had my master list. I didn't want flyers, three or four flyers going to the same household. So yeah. I deleted um, the, the doubles or the multiples. So if it went to your student that has graduated, but is still at your residence, that is the one flyer that your household will receive. And, so not, and just, yeah. not all four voters in the household would have gotten it. It would have went to one, even though it may not have been the parents. Yeah, and, and that's the technical requirement, right? Is that it has to go to every household with a registered voter. 
Correct. So I said taxpayer, that, that I shouldn't have said taxpayer. It's the flyer goes to every household with a registered voter. So if you don't have a registered voter, you might not get a uh, flyer. Correct. Yep. So and, just and for clarity, Lily received one and Reese received one. Neil and Brenda did not. So we received two. So it might have just been a, a little bit of a mix up there. Yeah, I'm not sure why that was, but I, I tried to eliminate most of the doubles. Okay. I think we got another John wanted to. Is there a John? I'm, I'm not seeing a John. Okay. I'm going to go back to the chat while I go there. There's one. John right there. Can you see him, Ryan? You're right by Brett. My screen isn't necessarily the same as it. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, John, you should be good. Yes, we made connection now. There you go. Uh, I, I noticed on the mail out, it says in here under the ag school tax credit that it is estimated that it will cover 50%. In other words, we all know nothing's safe when the legislature is in session. We're hoping we have enough money to pay 50% this year. We're hoping we'll have enough to pay 60% next year. And we're hoping enough we'll have to pay 70% in 2023. Uh, that's an awful lot of hope and estimate. Uh, how many years does this bond referendum run for? But, so the, the length of the term is 25 years. Okay. And um, the Ag to School program, which was initiated a few years ago, uh, that's why there's that step up in the amount that's being credited to, to Ag land owners. Um, that is a, a program that I, I think maybe the, the, what, you're ask, what you're trying to get at is, is it's not a given in the future, right? That's, is that right. the question, right? Yes. Uh, so what we can, again, the legislature can do whatever the legislature wants, right? Um, right? But once we are in the program, my feeling would be, and I would hope that you are not then removed from the program. So if we are able to secure the bonds against a public process that people voted on being told that the state was going to contribute an amount of money that we will be held harmless if the state decides to remove that program in the future. So if we are in the program starting in February, because that's when the bond passes, hopefully, um, we then qualify for the program and they can't take that program away from us. If, now I'm not saying that the state can't do whatever the state wants to do, right? But it is, feasible that in their legislative sessions that they removed the Ag to School program in May, for instance, for starting fiscal year 22. So then if we were to run another bond referendum, if it does not pass in February, then that program might not be available. So then we would absolutely be stuck covering the whole amount. So, so in other <laughs> words, in other words, when, in other words, am I coming through? Yep. There you go. You're right, John. In other words, then uh, there are no guarantees. I look at my own tax, real estate tax situation, and we're looking at about $10 an acre, which is highly unaffordable. And if that were to go to $20 an acre, we're looking at bankruptable. Uh, I really don't think you have the tax base here to support this. We don't have much for commercial businesses left in our towns. Everyone knows the best way to sell a commercial building right now is not pay the taxes for seven years and then the county owns it. I think you're looking at, uh, I, I look back at Wilmer and all the, the work they went through to sell 50, $50 million school over a humongous school district. We're not in that situation. We don't have the commercial business. All we have is the farming situation. And, the, and we all know the farmland is being appraised at its a value that you would sell it for. But I wouldn't sell my house in town for twice what it's valued at. And I would be a fool to sell it for that. 
So I question if I don't think we have the tax base to cover this. Another thing I'd like to talk about is the maintenance. In the past, this school district has not found the money for maintenance. We all have put up new buildings and everything else over our lifetime. And we all know that just because it's new doesn't end the maintenance. How do you guarantee this to us that you will put aside the money for maintenance that we don't destroy the building like what's happened to the buildings we have now? And I guess I've spoken enough, That's but I would like an answer to those questions. I think that's very true, John. And that's why I mentioned that maintenance is, you have maintenance regardless. And so you need to budget and you need to set your accordingly. And, uh, and so I think you need to stay ahead of the game. And uh, for an example is roofs. Uh, that's always a big item for school districts. So you need to have a budget and you need to have it planned out so that it's in a, re uh, a cycle where a plan where it's repaired as needed. And don't wait until um, you get to the point we are right now. So that's, that's, I think is mismanagement. And so I agree with that. But going back to the ag two, uh, ag to school, ag credit, that is credit locked in if you, with the year you pass it. So if you get the 50s, right now it's at 60%. The next year it goes up to 70. Then that's statute, that's in place. And so what Ryan just said, it would take an act of the legislature to take that away from you, but you're selling a bond for 55, for 25 years based on that figure. So, I think it would be very unlikely that the legislature would come out of, uh, of a session and take something away that you have locked in. Uh, I think that'd be very difficult. I've been in enough years that what I feel this ag to school credit was a balance act between the metro area and outstate. And the MREA, the MSBA, uh, School board associations worked very hard lobbying for this, and they spent years um, uh, getting this in. And the reason is because outstate was being did not have the dollars that the, the metro had for maintenance and taking care of facilities. And so, once they passed this, then all of a sudden, instead of having these older buildings and not being able to repair them, there you see a lot of rural schools now moving forward and, and creating the buildings that our kids deserve and our staff. And so I think that's a pretty solid move. Um, I would say if for that for that chance, uh, you, you can talk to your legislative people. You can uh, talk to them. Andrew Lang is one that I think is one that would support that. Uh, that and so for you to take that away once it's been in place and if you've got it locked into a bond i think that would be uh very difficult for the legislature to do but uh, the legislator has surprised us at other things but uh, that i think is something that's pretty locked in okay? well the flip side is if they don't take it away from us and they haven't got the money they're going to have to go levy back against the real estate to get the money to pay it, which guess whose pocket that's going to come out of. Well, uh, maybe, one more, maybe, maybe one we more. can get, so one, one, I'll answer that, John. Maybe one thing, we can get some Metro money out here to help us. Well, that would, uh, our numbers aren't here to mandate that. We don't, we don't have that state. much power. I'm talking of state dollars. Well, yeah, but we don't have the power in the legislature either, the rural uh, people. Uh, another question I have is on the, uh, we're actually building this on the hope that there will be a fitness center added to it at a later date, at a later cost. We have no ideas what the, the, the share of it will be, what the scope of it would be, the dollars of it, the services it will provide. And in the meantime, we know we won't have a swimming pool anymore, but what is the school's plan to do with this, the swimming pool there in a joint ownership with the city, what's going to happen to that? 
For generations, we have felt the importance of our kids knowing how to swim. I mean, that pool goes back to the 1900 building was when the first one was built and been upgraded ever since. And are we just going to bulldoze her down? And uh, sorry, folks, you can take your kids to the lake to swim. That's a good question uh, for everybody involved with the communities. And, uh, and that building or that pool is very expensive. It takes a lot of maintenance. A lot of our maintenance dollars have gone to that. And that's where we've struggled with that. And the city now has taken over the management of it. They've taken over the finances of it right now. Uh, and so I think that's a community adventure. And so what you're saying is very true. Um, so uh, that's something we have to plan on. As far as the wellness center, that's a separate entity. The hospital is doing that. And they're waiting to see what we're going to do. And then they've got their plans moving. And so that wellness center will be their project and not, uh, not the school project. It's two separate projects. Well, I think it's time to let somebody else talk now. So I'm just gonna okay. <laughs> sit back and listen now. So. Okay, I'll do the same thing, John. Thank you. You bet. Lisa, but I think there's two of you in the screen. You're you're open. Yes, um, I, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, you can tell who our technical advisor is. Teresa's on the on the title here. So, uh, I'm Randy Terstig. My wife Teresa. We live in the Bold School District area here. Uh, I, I have a couple a couple comments really, and then, and then a couple questions. So, uh, the the, the ag school tax credit, uh, I unfortunately have been uh, become pretty well versed uh, on how these regulations and laws and and uh, such work at the state for some unfortunate uh, uh, situations we've been in. And uh, I, I'll just give you a really quick short history. About a dozen years ago, uh, myself backed by a couple hundred farmers uh, through, uh, through co-ops and such, invested quite heavily, uh, millions and millions of dollars in a fertilizer plant that the state had a 22 and a half year mandate that was gonna run uh, through a power plant. So uh, that was a 22 and a half year commitment. Uh, not really like, uh, not like the bylaws for this ag program. It really is quite short. It says three years and beyond. This is a 22 and a half year mandate. Uh, between peers and other groups, over $100 million were invested in this project. And guess what the state did? 10 years into it, they didn't renew it. There was, it, they, they actually cut it off. 22 and a half year commitment. People invested tens of millions of dollars and the state very quietly wiped this off the table just like that. And those businesses, many of them were put out of business. Many were broke. And, and I've, I've got a lobbyist that, that works in uh, the Capitol. Uh, been down there for several years now trying to resolve this issue. And, and I see exactly what happens. In, in this particular situation, we had some comfort level to state backing it 22 and a half year contract commitment from the state of Minnesota. And also many municipalities were involved in this as well. So we felt with municipalities and other, as, as you mentioned earlier, lobbying groups, that were for this, that nothing like this could ever happen. Well, guess what happens to rural Minnesota? Municipalities, they, they were given other deals to make up for this. And the farmers and solely the farmers and the truckers and the loggers and the guys out in rural Minnesota were given absolutely zero. They ended this thing with a two week notice. And that's what really concerns me with this program. You think it can't happen? Many of us invested heavily in it. Many of the farmers from Rhode Island invested heavily from it. And, and anyone that supported some of the local co-ops invested heavily in it. And it was just unfathomable to us that the state could do that, but that's exactly what they did. And what I see happening with this program, this will be put in place or it isn't put in place. And it was easy to put in place because they're not seeing the dollars of it. The cost isn't there yet. But as soon as the state has to start reimbursing these dollars, that's when it's gonna hit the limelight down there and someone's gonna say, well, hold on a minute here. 
why are we subsidizing farmers? Farmers don't need subsidies. And, uh, you know, Governor Walls, uh, his one Minnesota is, is, is a nice slogan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not sure that's always well meant or uh, well, well believed in down there. So at the end of the day, that goes away. The farmers would be, hen would be uh, as John had stated earlier, they'll be holding the bag on this thing. And it really concerns me. It does not matter. Once you're in the program, they can cut you off tomorrow. I, I mean, I'm not saying that's gonna happen. And I think it's a fabulous program if it stays in place. But my concern is there needs to be better, uh, better conversations and everybody needs to understand that this is not a 50% money upfront to pay for the school. I would feel completely different if it was that situation. That would, be, that would be really nice. And as you said, with a low percentage of bonding right now, it'd be fabulous time to build a new school. But I'm really afraid two, three, four years down the road, all of a sudden they're gonna see what this is costing at the state level and they're gonna end it. And, and that kind of goes into the next thing. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned on some advertising because I don't need to show you this. You guys all got your flyer, but this, this it makes it look like it's written in stone and, and it's not. And it, it's, it's not as clear. I would say this flyer, unfortunately, is misrepresenting. And I'm not saying this to be negative. I truly believe the school needs to do something as well. So please don't take it that way. But I also wanna see if I can help prevent some big issues that could come down the road. Because if the farmers are pushed too heavily, some farmer is gonna bring this up and say, hey, hey, uh, Bold School District, you told me I was gonna pay 50% of this. I'm not gonna pay it. And there'll be some attorney out there that'll say, you're right, that's what they told you. I mean, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but those are concerns and that's the kind of business I'm in. I worry about this stuff. And I'd hate to see Bold School District in some sort of ugly situation where somebody could come back and say, hey, they committed to this uh, and, and just have that go really ugly. So what I'm not saying is things shouldn't go forward and, and I, I think the dollar amount is too much. I'll, I'll say that, but I think something needs to be done with the school. So please don't take it I'm all negative. However, I think there's some misrepresentation here that people aren't gonna understand and could really create havoc uh, with something down the road in a few years if it ends. Uh, and I know they already had some discussion on it. So I don't think if you wanna pipe in, that's fine, but I will just say it's happened to me. It's happened to many of us. It's destroyed businesses in Minnesota. I know Andrew Lang very well. Andrew's a fabulous guy. We have a lot of great representation out here in Western Minnesota, but unfortunately we're a small group. And when you get down to that area, uh, I mean, I'll say it, the, the majority of the urban legislatures aren't too concerned about what happens to farmers in uh, Western Minnesota. That, that's just the fact of it. it uh, and you think those other groups are gonna tie on with you? They'll tie in with you till they get bought out on a debtor deal from the state. They'll be given something else. And I'm afraid we're gonna be sitting here on our own to pay for this thing. Um, so that's my comments in, in, in on that. But my other comment is, you know, I forget, I haven't not spent a lot of time on this. I just looked at this flyer. I haven't seen any other information, but on the tax calculator worksheet, uh, the commercial industrial section, I believe there's an air there. It's been corrected. It's been yeah. corrected, Randy. It's, uh, okay. We're sending out a notice, uh, a postcard this in, end of this week. Yes, that, uh, that is supposed to be uh, um, those, the, on the commercial part is wrong. It's, uh, correct me if I'm. Um, the right. estimated market values for the commercial yeah. industrial should be read 150, 175, 200 yeah. okay. in lieu of the 100, 200, 1 million. The numbers okay. in the chart are right, but the estimated value of that, those three sections are, are off. Yeah. So okay. you, we'll get everybody that got a flyer, will get one of those postcards with that correction on it. We just, uh, that was brought to us yesterday and we got it corrected, so. Okay. It, I would just suggest, I'm assuming you have some legal counsel just to make sure that's acceptable. Because since the voting has already opened and that false or uh, incorrect information was out, again, I don't want to be negative. I just don't want something to come back to the school and board and this gets to get really ugly. 
because if I look at this million dollar value, it said I was going to pay $95 a month. And honestly, I, when we had a discussion the other day in the office, I said, that's not that bad. I'm in favor of the school. That's not a problem. I mean, really. And then once I started looking at it, I said, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So that million dollar calculation obviously would be 600 some dollars a month instead of 90 some. So, but what if somebody has already voted? I think maybe just to give you a little at ease, everything that goes out, everything that we do is passed by legal counsel. So it isn't the district just whimsy out there, you know, throwing information and seeing what sticks. So we do go through that process. There's a bond council that's involved with all the decisions and, and, and the technical writing of everything that's, a, that's uh, sent out. So, you know, obviously we may, we would realize that there's a mistake. So we appropriately address the mistake, how, you know, you deemed appropriate. And they, it's okay that people that have already voted, we don't have to call them up and everybody, have to be notified or anything. Everybody's going to get a card that'll state the difference. And okay. then, uh, and then they can move from there. If, yeah, I'm, if there is somebody that happened to get that flyer and then vote and then realize that there's, that that changed their mind all of a sudden, I would suggest they contact the district and see what we can do. I, I don't know in that case, what can happen if anything can happen, but at least let's start there. If, if that flyer was the thing that, that, you know, allowed somebody to make their decision and, and now they've changed their mind, let's, I would hope that they would contact the district. If they're aware until, you know, if they're aware before, if they become aware of the change, because, you know, if you're like me, you uh, do that, clear the desk and it's off my mind and onto something else. So that would be my concern that somebody expects a $90 a month uh, hit and all of a sudden it's 600 or 700 a month. But uh, obviously your council should have that under control. So. And, and I think the postcard will be a, an eye opener. And if you get that postcard, then you should should make reference to it. So. I hope it, but like Ryan said, if there is a question, then bring it into the office and we'll let our attorneys work with, so, okay? Good. Sure, sure. I, I just, the other note, I just wonder if there should be something on that postcard as well on this 50% uh, ag credit that people realize that's that's uh, not a given upfront guaranteed 100% done deal. I, I think there should be something in the postcard as well that, that explains that because I'm afraid that's some misrepresentation and that could come back to haunt somebody. Okay. I'm, that's all I have to say. <laughs> appreciate your time. And I do appreciate board members and your work and, and uh, dedication to school. I just you, I obviously have my concerns. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next question, uh, I don't see anybody raising. Oh wait, Nicholas Hendricks, I'll unmute you. That's me, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, I'm Nick Hendricks. I cover the district for the Renville County Register. Uh, I'm also a, a vested parent in the district. I have three daughters that attend Bold School. My wife used to work there as a para. Um, I started covering this uh, the school district soon after these talks started in March of 2019. So I've sat in it practically almost every meeting since. So my question comes with a little preface for people who maybe haven't worn at all of the meetings. Um, when the steering committee meetings began last spring, the relationship between ICS and convicted Shakopee Superintendent Rod Thompson was made aware to the committee. Thompson pleaded guilty to soliciting bribes uh, when you, Ryan, responded to the subject, he did not, you did not deny the involvement with Thompson, simply described what happened. ICS worked with the FBI, you said, and ICS was not named in any court documents. And that you said in hindsight, that was not a good idea. The aftermath of that, of the ICS's relationship with Shakopee was written about in an article, uh, said that ICS also after was going to provide money to, to have a separate audit of the referendum and the ICS would also not build the district for a total of $218,725, 72,000 of which were outstanding fees on the project. ICS would also stop billing reimbursable costs like mileage 
And I guess we're, the district was being built for on-site trailers from that point forward on the high school project. ICS continued providing services as the owner representative of the high school project. And Shackopee said that they were very happy with the building. But Wold architects and engineers and school district officials had to provide additional oversight and supervision throughout the completion. Likewise, Mike Holeisel, who has been consulting with Bold for Baird Financial, was involved in an investigation at the Stillwater District in 2015, involving a much higher bond amount. Um, anyone can Google the details for themselves of that investigation. But the thing that stuck out to me was the shock to the district and its constituents when the bond monies were dispersed to the school district, which included a six-figure $115,000 financial advisor fee to Baird. So my question is, how is ICS and Baird Financial being paid from this referendum? How much is the district uh, paying ICS? How much is the district paying Baird? Is it in writing? Do the board members know? Um, to my recollection, it has never been discussed at any meeting. Thank you. So, okay, uh, how is ICS being paid? Our initial contract with Bull Public Schools, which started almost two years ago, to the day, maybe two years ago and a week, um, our, our contract was for facility assessments and referendum or, or facility planning, right? Um, I, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head because it was so long ago, but I think our initial contract was between 13 and $15,000, somewhere in that realm. Uh, and that's all that the Bold Public Schools has had a contract with ICS for up to this point. Uh, it is assumed, or uh, I guess um, on, on, from my standpoint, that the, the construction management portion of the referendum would be something that ICS would have the ability to uh, continue forth with the district on uh, after a successful referendum. Uh, and, and our rates for construction management would be typical rates of any construction management firm in the state of Minnesota. Those typically realm in the the range of three to five percent of construction costs. So that would be set once the referendum passed. So the district does not have a contract right now with ICS. Uh, beyond that initial $13,000, $15,000 assessment uh, and planning contract uh, set two years ago. Okay. If the, red, if the referendum does not pass, um, which Likewise, I should preface by saying, too, I am in support of it because I do have three students there and I had a wife that worked at the elementary school and knew the conditions and I had girls coming home with headaches and asthma that developed while they were there. Um, but I also feel for the the farmers and land owners because I own just a very small part of uh, land in Olivia. So my taxes are not affected to that extent. So my biggest concern was that if the referendum does pass, that the right amount of money goes to towards the school and the students that should. Thank you. And I'll just uh, talk a little bit about what happened in those cases too, uh, Nick. Um, they were both, ICS uh, and Mike uh, were both cleared of any wrongdoing. The, um, the individual that was involved with the Shakopee is no longer an employment employee employee of ICS, they correct it the best they can. The superintendent was at fault. And so then he was charged also. So, so I think, you know, it, it happened and, uh, and ICS was very open about it uh, at a meeting, uh, Ryan uh, and his owner, they, they presented uh, a document that stated, stated that. And so I think they were very upfront with us. And so I don't think they're trying to hide that at it all. So I appreciate the honesty that they've shown. And, and again, uh, we had the one contract that was put in place in January, uh, two years ago. And, and that's the, that's all we've paid uh, ICS from that point until now. And he has spent, ICS has spent tons of hours uh, putting the project together for us. So, so I think, uh, I don't know what it would be the hourly rate, but it'd be pretty minimal. Right. I agree. Uh, yeah. The number of hours that have gone to it. I just don't remember That's it ever being discussed at any meeting. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, looking, I don't see any hands. Oh. oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. One quick question I forgot. Could uh, do you have a simple cash flow statement for the operations of the school for the next two to three years? 
uh, with projected student enrollment costs, maintenance. Uh, I don't need all of your line item detail, but a couple page simple cash flow statement that you could share. Yeah. Do you have that one, Ryan, or? I, I think he's talking about operations of the school, not anything to do with construction. That's Correct, a, operation, operating and cash flow, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I assume Dale, Lindsay puts together what? Lindsay would have one, have one there yeah. put together and we could, I could, she's not on right now and she's, she's our business manager. So that's the one we work with, so. Um, so we'd have that made available through her so she would have it okay it, that'd be great could uh, if she could email that just that would show the projected school enrollment and yeah i can do okay. that right. okay that'd be great thank, thank you. you and maybe just to, to dovetail off that uh, school enrollment is projected to decline over the next five years that's that the districts have to project five years out every year um, so they are projected to decline, and that's been accounted for in, in size of school and, in, and, and like you're talking about operating uh, funds and, and things like that. One of the reasons going to a single facility is important and was part of the, the, the task force kind of uh, discussions and, and recommendations was operating two facilities was not feasible uh, for the district to continue to do. So that's one of the driving forces to, to get to a single facility. So, um, the to what extent has the Bold Schools Board discussed joining with any neighboring districts to address facilities? We've uh, the superintendents have talked to each. Uh, or I have talked to both districts and. Uh, and we've been very open um, on talking about pairing and sharing or whatever uh, our districts need. And so um, we have had uh, discussions with BLHS recently. And so uh, uh, this morning we met with the superintendent and the board chairs, and we talked about what, uh, what, our, um, what we're looking at. And so uh, both districts are, working on their own and basis right now. Um, BLHS just finished up a, or working on their strategic uh, plan. And so they're doing that, but um, there was not any type of talk of uh, consolidation or moving together as, as two districts. And so uh, I think um, uh, we're putting together a, a statement uh, that'll go to the boards, uh, each of the boards is, uh, uh, this month and uh, and then this is what we'll look at so but yeah we're constantly talking back and forth about what programs and things that we can share and can we can do together and so uh, uh, we are looking at those things so okay um Okay, explain the absentee ballot process and where the ballot applications need to be sent. It is unclear. Um, the application tells you to send to the county auditor. So yes, that we, we hopefully made it a little bit more clear on the website. There was some reference to the state of Minnesota Secretary of State on how to vote. Uh, you know, the guidelines for a, a referendum election follow the guidelines of, a, of any other election, right? So there, the Secretary of State uh, helps set how an election is run. Because this election is a special election and it's only a school district ballot question, the school district is responsible for running it. Uh, so in this case, the counties are not responsible for running it. Uh, they still provide assistance with, with ballot counting machines and, and assistance with finding election judges and things like that. Uh, but technically they're not responsible. So the district is responsible for that. So it, it was a little confusing because we tried to give more information on how an election is run by sending people to the secretary of state. But that also was confusing then because it seemed like it should go through the county process of what a typical general election is. And that's not what we're running here. So we hopefully made that clear, but the absentee ballots should be sent to the district office. So hopefully a long-winded answer to, to get to the specific answer is 
the absentee ballot should be sent to the district office. And that's hopefully clear now on the website if you were to go take a look there. Do not send them to the county auditor. Okay? That won't, don't do that. Um, there's a question that says, please explain how the Ag to School tax thing works. I think we've probably discussed that at length. Uh, Jim, if you want to, you know, talk about that, maybe send us an email or, or, or reach out again and we can talk to you directly. Um, what is the projected enrollment of our district in the future? Um, so like I said, the district is required to uh, submit that with the review and comment. We talked about that document a little bit earlier. Uh, and off the top of my head, I wanna say between now and the five year projection, uh, we're at 623 now and in five years, it, it incrementally decreases. And I wanna say it's 567, I think was the projected enrollment uh, at that point. So we did take that into account in, in like I said, building size and square footage and, and operations and all those good things of a, of a new facility. So um, that is included in, in the, the State Department's uh, review of the project and, and financing around it. Um, Neil had a question here, but I think we, we talked to him about that. Um, Mark Gleisner. Wouldn't it be reasonable to get a commitment from the hospital? And secondly, if the wellness center is not a part of the plan, what would be the additional cost to the district once the center is built? So, okay. Uh, the hospital has uh, passed a resolution uh, in support of the school district building a building on hospital property. So, it, you know, from their aspect, I think they've provided the commitment that they're uh, you know, willing to make at this point to say, yes, we're here and you can use our land to build your building. Um, if the wellness center is not part of the plan, what would the additional cost to the district uh, be once the center is built? Um, as far as if it's, if it's a completely separate structure built at a separate time, or even if it's attached, but at a separate date, uh, there's, there's no additional cost uh, that the district is gonna put into that. The district has the amount of money they have to build the building they have. Um, so there would be no additional funds from the district to, to contribute to that. And I don't think there would ever plan on asking for any additional funds from the, the public to do such things. So um, that becomes more of a hospital uh, project at that point. Um, operationally, uh, of course, uh, the district would have to look at um, if a wellness center is built, uh, how to operate it, but again, hopefully with efficiencies of space and, and location, that, that operation is not something that's impactful to their current operation now. It's people that would be in place uh, already on the payroll of the district and, and operating it as such. So uh, any, any additional um, you know, operations would then have to be covered by hopefully the hospital or, or worked out in some manner. Um, Thirdly, given the historical lack of maintenance, please convince me that maintenance will be a priority. Uh, like Dale said, so one thing that's happened recently, and I'm saying recently, it's been within the last few years, uh, is the district has allowed, or the, the state of Minnesota has put in place uh, a program for maintenance for rural districts. And that program is, is now in its, its final stage of being implemented. So the amount of money a district gets is, is a formula, of course, it's not super cut and dry, but a formula based on the enrollment in the district, the size, meaning square footage of building in the district and the age of the buildings in the district. So based on those three components, uh, the max amount that a district can receive is $380 per student. Uh, it's a simple way to look at it uh, per year for maintenance. So the district will be allowed to put together a plan. That's part of the Department of Education's requirements is every year the district has to submit a 10-year maintenance plan. Again, this is a new program, started a few years ago. So every year the district has to submit to the State Department a 10-year maintenance plan. So that maintenance plan oftentimes eclipses the, uh, the, the maintenance required uh, for districts because they're dealing with old facilities and they just don't get the amount of revenue that is required to fix them. Um, but it, it's one step, I guess, uh, to help districts and the state uh, understand the maintenance requirements of the facilities. So 
hopefully with that program being in place and, and the, the requirements of the district to have to fill out those, those forms, it, it keeps the eyes open of not just the facilities director or not just the custodian, but, but the board, the, the administration of the district to understand what the facility needs are. Um, that's, that's one thing I, I hope uh, looking forward here that, that you know, is in place that wasn't previously that can help out with that. Um, and then fourth, I must assume administration will live with will live within this district. I guess I don't. That doesn't seem to be a question. Um, okay. Next one is from what I figured at 50 graduates per year for 50 years would it cost us 62 million dollars? That works out to 24 thousand dollars per graduate. Um, in building cost, is there a national average cost on this? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I definitely haven't done that type of research. Um, I can definitely look into things like that, uh, see what I can find. Obviously, it's going to be probably hard to, to do a, a national average. All I would have really access to is probably the work that we do, which is just located in Minnesota mostly. Um, but that's, that's one I would have to circle back to. Uh, national cost per student graduate for building. Um, but we'll, we'll try to get to that. Um, some people talking about flyers, not receiving a flyers. Um, okay, we'll, we'll look into making sure that every address that we can gets, uh, gets a flyer. So uh, that was our goal was every address gets a flyer. If they, if someone hasn't received the information, please give the district office a, a call, and and Joy will pursue it and uh, get it taken care of. And so, yeah. and also uh, a lot of the information that's in those flyers is on our website. So um, please uh, take a look at that. And uh, I think um, they've done an excellent job of putting that together. There's a lot, a ton of information, probably more than you really want. But uh, please take the time to do that so that you can be uh, be educated and and uh, vote what uh, what how you feel you should so thank you yeah I, I i hate to say absolutes but i'm pretty sure there is nothing on that flyer that is not on the website so if you've been to the website and gone through that you've seen all the information that was on the flyer um Okay. You can always email, text, or uh, the district office, and uh, and we get back to you as in as uh, quick as we can with okay. an answer that uh, you may have. So, looks like Don't we have a question. To contact us. Yep. Looks like we have a question from John Dotson. So, John, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yep, I'd like to go back to the question that. Um, every household was um, sent a flyer on this information. Well, my household has two um, people, uh, registered voters in our school district, but only one has received the flyer of information. And I respect my partner. I don't open up her mail, but then if everyone was supposed, every registered voter was supposed to get a uh, flyer, why didn't they get it? it? It's not every registered voter, it's every household with a registered voter. So if there's four registered voters in one household, you get one. If there's one registered voter in one household, you get one. So okay. in some cases, we, we there might have been two that were sent or three or four for more registered voters just to because the, the listserv uh, works that way, but the requirement is one per household with a registered voter. Okay. So uh, Neil asked, we are being asked to approve an approximately $60 million bond. Why aren't there any plans or renderings available? How are we supposed to know what a building what the building and rooms are going to look like. Um, what, is, what is the cost of the district for the 
company hired to, to get the bond approved. The company for the vote yes committee. Okay, um, so I'll address the, 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 the rendering question. This comes up quite a bit. Um, and, and Dale was asked for, for renderings and plans of buildings. Uh, it's, it's just something that's not done. So uh, I know that that's a concept that people are, 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 it's tough to understand, but in order to draw a building, um, to design a building, to show you what a building looks like takes, uh, in this case, we're planning on 12 months of, of architectural time. And that takes information from staff, it takes information from administration, it takes information from community members, it takes information from business owners, all of those people have to communicate and, and describe the needs and the, the adjacencies and the, the function of this facility. So that process happens after once after the approval uh, to move forward. Um, it, it will cost uh, just to get a rendering, it could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could, it's going to cost millions of dollars to put a plan together. So the district is in no position to spend a million dollars or so to create a plan of a building project that they have not yet received the approval for. So this is the same for every district. Uh, it's, not, it's not bold specific that there's no plan. Um, in some cases, districts that are doing renovations or a simple addition, uh, they go out for referendum. It's a little easier to describe and to, to show what that addition looks like because it logically fits somewhere. Um, or, or, or there's a space within a building that the renovation is going to take place. So that's more uh, easily obtainable to, to have some descriptions there. So if you've seen other referendums, that's probably what's happened is, is you, there's a, a logical uh, design to what's happening. This is a brand new building. There is no concept uh, of this building yet. We are working off of historical data within the state of Minnesota based on a square footage of a building, which is based on enrollment of the building and the construction costs of, of like buildings throughout the state. So, and that's what we're stuck with. Uh, we, the, the coupled question to this is, how do we know that we're not gonna spend over uh, $57 million? Again, that's, that's my company's responsibility is to make sure that that does not happen. Uh, we have architecture engineers that design the building. We have uh, firms like mine that, that manage the construction and, and stick to time schedules and budgets. So there isn't an additional cent that's, that's given after the fact. Uh, we have to stick to that budget. Luckily, we have a fantastic track record of being able to hold within those budgets and, and design the buildings uh, within them. Wold, our partner, we've worked with on, on dozens and dozens of, of projects like this, uh, similar with other architects throughout the state. Uh, so um, you know, we're, we're a checks and balances system that, that makes sure that the project that's identified is the project that's delivered. Uh, but there's a ton of input that happens, um, you know, after the approval in order to start the design process. Um, you know, if, if I were to put up a building that had a, a, you know, super high beaming glass walls and, and you know, fancy facade, people are going to, some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it. I put up a building that is a, a brick front, flat, small windows, um, you know, pitched roof. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. So providing a plan right now is not something that uh, is going to get us any further of, of people understanding what a building can look like. So uh, we do that on purpose. And that's not, uh, that's not just a bold thing. So hopefully that explains it. I know some people don't like that answer uh, and, and don't agree with it, but um, it's, it's the way that the, the process is completed. I got a, a comment here about the fees charged and things that we talked about that a little bit ago and coming from Baird Financial and, and just Mike is letting us know that uh, they have a preliminary engagement agreement. Uh, and I'm just gonna read this to his comment. He said, uh, it's a preliminary engagement agreement and it's as based on a specific percent of the amount of the bonds sold. No fees can nor will be charged unless successful borrowing occurs. Also, all fees, BAIRDs, ICSs, and all the necessary parties are part of the review and comment submitted. So that's all been submitted in the final. 
uh, proposal. So all those fees are in there. So we're not, um, uh, we're ahead of it as far as uh, what is going to be charged, what's going to be the cost of everything. So that's all in there. So, the okay. final part of Neil's uh, question, what was the cost of the district for the company hired to get the bond approved? And then he has in parentheses the company for the vote yes committee. The district is not part of, the district does not, uh, I guess, hire a company for the vote yes committee. So I don't, I'm not sure where that, that comes from or what, what the question is there. Um, there is a, a support committee out there and that's run by community members. Some of those community members might be members of the district or, and might not be, uh, but they're not tied uh, as far as an affiliation to the district or any sort of um, commitment there or company hiring. Uh, if a new school is built, will the old school be torn down for sure? Um, so there is money allocated in the referendum plan for uh, the demolition of both facilities, both Rhode Island and uh, the Olivia campus. The pool aspect of the Olivia campus is something that the district and the city of Olivia will work out. Um, Obviously that, that pool being operated and, and maintained and, and things like that by the city, uh, there'll have to be discussions on, on how they want that facility to move forward. That's, that's gonna be their uh, discussion to, uh, to be part of and, and whether or not they wanna continue to operate that facility and, and such. So, um, but there is money allocated for uh, the, that demolition. And again, that, you know, looking at this point, uh, that's a minimum of three years from now, uh, because that's how long the process would take to design and build a new facility. Um, if sports was part of the vote doesn't pass, what will happen? Will they use the old school for that? Yes, the football field and track, uh, if question two does not pass, they will continue to use the existing football field and track. What are some things that will be offered to the teachers and students if we build a new school that wouldn't be offered uh, if we just repair uh, the school. Um, so there's a lot of design elements. I, I would encourage you to um, look on the website again underneath the plan. There's, there's been some photos added of what new schools look like today, uh, schools that are in the state of Minnesota. So you can kind of see some of the, the offerings of spaces and, and how uh, students and teachers use them. Um, so that's that's part of when you talk about uh, just fixing the existing Olivia campus, um, when we talk about that the, the school to, to repair and to make use of the existing Olivia school uh, is where it gets into be over 60% of the cost of a new building. To make it look like what a new building would look like, that's what we take into consideration. So um, look at the, the, the flexible learning spaces and, and, and classrooms and, and collaboration areas along with cafeterias and, and kitchens and things like that, the auditorium, all of those components, if we were to renovate uh, the existing Olivia School, would eclipse that 60% value. That's what we take into account. Um, but there are some good pictures in there. Uh, but again, uh, those are for example, that's not meaning that's what's going to be built. It's, it's showing you what similar districts and similar schools have built and, and we would expect similar types of uh, amenities within this new facility. I think uh, that can what would be really expanded to the new facility when you look at the opportunities it's gonna provide in, in different teaching strategies with uh, students uh, learn different today than what we did when we were in school. So I think uh, that is something that um, that it would, would change drastically. And uh, you look at facilities today, what uh, the opportunity there for group work, for multimedia, um, tech ed area is, uh, it's not just woods and metals anymore. And so I think uh, bring in the egg, uh, plus uh, the robotics, uh, electronics, technology, uh, it, where do you stop? You know, it's uh, it's um, it would give an opportunity for a lot of growth, uh, where you would be confined to four walls in a classroom, 
Um, it's going to be um, if the uh, if the bond is passed, then, like Ryan said, it takes a year to design. And uh, I would recommend that we'll be looking at making visits to different schools and seeing uh, how they did things and what works out. And, um, and so uh, teachers need to do that as well as parents, uh, uh, community members and everything. And so another area that has been brought to my attention is that uh, what about an auditorium? Uh, why do we, is that a luxury or, or shouldn't we? And the board debated a lot about that. And, and the feeling was from the survey results and from the community members talking to mem board members and things that the auditorium is very key, is very important. And what I've seen in the musicals the last couple of years, uh, I would totally agree um, that those kids, as much work they put into that and their, their directors, uh, that they that uh, they would really be able to expand with a with a, an auditorium. Plus, that auditorium becomes part of the community. The community owns it. The area owns that building. So, whenever you're going to have a large group gathering, uh, that would be something that would be available. And uh, and uh, to bring large groups in, and uh, whether it's community plays, community businesses that would use it. Um, that's one thing with the, the facilities that have got an auditorium that I'm aware of. That's one part of the facility that is used by everybody involved. So, um, so I think the board debating about it, do we add that onto the bond or do we keep it separate? And their feeling was that if we're gonna have a new facility, then we wanna have an auditorium uh, involved with it too. And that was uh, coming from the community's interest. So, so I think that's, that's why it's there and not a second question like the, the athletics uh, was. So. Looks like Thomas provided a link for average cost per student. So he's doing some of the work for us. Thank you, Thomas. Obviously take into account when you look at nationwide average costs, you know, Minnesota is different than California is different than, you know, New York on, on building costs, but um, there's a link there if anybody wants to go to it. Um, if the new school is passed, is there funding there to maintain a safe school for the teacher and student for the next three years? Uh, I'm assuming meaning the, the existing Olivia school. Um, they say that it's not up to standards, but they have to stay in it for another three years. That's true. So there is, there is uh, work that will have to be done to that building. Obviously, if, if the referendum passes, the district will prioritize uh, any spending to, to be appropriate, to, to make sure that they're not um, you know, gonna try to be as wasteful and, and do work that is just gonna be tore down in, in a few years. Um, but, but to the point, it has to be a safe and operating facility for the next three years for sure. So uh, the district will take that to, into account. Um, there is a vote yes committee making calls. How are they getting cell phone numbers? Um, I think uh, the way that they go about their business uh, as they work with, uh, I believe the district has a, a parent list that is open to the public and they start with that. And then they also use uh, registered voter lists too. So um, they run that, I'm not sure exactly exact, you know, how uh, they obtain all those different numbers. That's, that's done by a, by a different entity. So I don't get into that. Uh, you got about a minute left, Ryan. Yeah. Um, Any quick questions? Linda Ram is, is noting the cost of court square foot per student. Again, I'd have to understand what the $44,000 per square foot per student that is in that article is, is based off of versus our, uh, our amount here. So, um, Maybe I can I can talk with Linda about that uh, specifically. Uh, was the plan to close Bird Island campus set before the new school information was put out? Um, no, the the referendum was set forth in November of this year. Uh, the school closure was initiated. I think well, school was moved or temporary closed in April of this year, right? 
Blue uh, and, and then the closure was in October. So the board not had not yet made the decision to go out for a referendum um, before closing Bird Island Elementary School. Um, how is the Olivia building uh, over 60%? Yeah, so I, I touched on that a little bit. The deferred maintenance listed for the, the Olivia building at, at 17, almost $18 million, that's one component. Uh, there's other components that would require be required within the Olivia building to make it um, meet what we would consider the educational standards of today. So that includes renovations, um, some additional space, believe it or not, within that facility for things like cafeteria uh, and, and whatnot. So when you combine all the, the maintenance needs along with the educational improvements is what we call it, um, that's where building those all together gets you up into that 60% mark. Uh, that was a question that the MDE uh, wanted us to clarify. So we, uh, Department of Education, sorry, didn't mean to use acronyms, but we had to provide that to the Department of Education as well um, to, to show them our breakdown of, of the, the current facility and how it had met the, the needs of the 60%. And I see that, that uh, uh, I'll respond to Matt and not Linda. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take the rest of those questions and um, take a look at those, Ryan, and then um, try and answer them the best we can. But it is eight o'clock. So um, yeah. any, any other things that you want to share, Ryan? But Again, yeah. we're available. Um, I, I think this is awesome that there was this many people that stayed this entire time. <laughs> uh, yeah. We must not have been too boring. Yeah, go to, the, go to the website, look at the video. Sorry, I wasted 10 minutes in the beginning. I, you guys staring at me, that, that was not needed. Um, but yeah, check out that video that, that provides some information too, so that you might not have heard tonight. Um, but continue to reach out via the website via Facebook, we'll, we'll try to respond as best we can to those questions as, as we go, but thank you. But if, if the bond passes and there's, there's an awful lot of work that will go into it, the designing of it and everything and community members will be very involved, staff, uh, students. Um, uh, and uh, if you get an opportunity, uh, <laughs> whenever we can go out and uh, do something other, get out to travel and take a look at other buildings, see what uh, districts are doing right now. There's a lot of change, but uh, with COVID right now, we're pretty limited. I'm like I said, I'm not familiar with this. I would rather have an, an auditorium where we would go in and sit down and talk and face to face. I think we're finding that out in education uh, that the best learning situation is face to face. And I think we've, we're as adults, we say, we're, we feel the same way. So I apologize for that, but with COVID, uh, this is the best we could do. So if, if we want, uh, we would, you know, entertain doing it again uh, in a week or two. And then, uh, so we'll see, but we'll evaluate, let us know what your thoughts are and we'll continue working, uh, moving forward with it. And, uh, doing the best we can to get information out to you. So, and good questions. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Good night now.